Assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. Tonight's topic will be looking at mixed gatherings, the cultural clash, if there is one, the law around it. What happens if one is to mix at work, in the gym, at home, in gatherings, social gatherings? What happens if one is invited to weddings which are actually mixed? After all, Hajj is mixed. But the mosques are all segregated. How does one interact? Is there a balance? Can there be a balance, as it were? What is the Sharia requirements around there? What is halal and what is not halal, as it were? With joining, joining me tonight, we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's a great pleasure to have you on again on this thank show. Thank you, thank you. Um, I haven't, haven't been, been on the show for a couple of weeks, but... Uh, We've missed you. Yes, and I've missed you as well, likewise. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Um, this topic is definitely quite pertinent. After all, if Islam claims to be dynamic and it has or seeks to fulfill all the requirements in the social atmosphere, there's, for example, um, attending places in halal environments, how does one, especially in this day and age, and this is quite important, especially for the youth, boys and girls mixing together, how does one, for example, go to the mosque where it's segregated, how, and also how does one interact outside? Well, it's, as you said, a contemporary issue, mm. because this question is raised in virtually every community that I've ever lectured in, and really goes to highlight just how many issues the Western demographic faces when it comes to law, because a lot of the discussions concerning mixed gatherings are discussions which were formulated in an environment mainly in the Middle East. We could say that even the Shi'i Ja'fari legal system, yeah. as we have it today, the main names involved in formulating an understanding of one's social responsibilities mm -hmm. or one's social etiquettes or one's ethics with the same or the opposite gender is formulated mainly in Iranian or in Iraqi circles. Okay. You're looking at these great scholars who would have either narrated the traditions of the Ahl al Bayt, peace be upon them, or were the main jurists who would have provided us with these guidelines. They would have provided these guidelines never really having lived in the West at any time. Yes. In many cases, when you bring up the names of Yazdi, or you bring up names such as Ansari, or you bring up names such as al hur al-Amili, uh -huh. or you bring up names such as Khoi and mm. others, a lot of the names of these personalities are names which originate from an environment where even the idea of eating in the same restaurant as a mixed party is sometimes frowned, frowned upon. upon. Yeah. Like when you go to certain parts of Iraq, for example, until today. Okay. Go to certain parts of Iraq, there'll be a section which is, let's say, a gents only section. Right. Then they'll happily have a section which is family only. And you'd hardly find a section where, in parts of Najaf, let's say, uh -huh. uh, which is tend to be seen as being more conservative, as it's the home of where many of these laws are made, many of the scholars live. Sure. It is very much frowned upon that there'll be girls and guys who are, for example, not mahram to each other, all sitting and having, for example, uh, some pizza together. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're looking at that, therefore, you find in the mid-90s, the community of the followers of Ahlul Bayt living in the West begun to ask certain questions. That I, for example, when I'm living in the West, 
I face situations where I'm in a mixed environment. What's my responsibility? What are my rights? Yeah. How about, for example, if I'm in the environment of the mosque? Okay. Um, say, for example, I'm in 1996, a set of questions were asked to Ayatollah Sistani. Right. May Allah lengthen his life. Inshallah. These questions which were asked were questions concerning what is allowed and what's not allowed in terms of mixing in relation to our mosques. Can we, for example, allow the teenagers in our mosques mm -hmm. to all mix? And mix in which way? The classic traditional style was always that there'll be a lecture given. Right. The men are on one side, the ladies okay. are on another. Okay. Is there any possibility that we can move towards a direction which seemingly other schools in Shiism may have moved towards, such as the Ismaili school? Yeah. Yeah. Ismailis, it's very normal for the men and the women to have events um, where they are discussing a pertinent religious, theological, legal matter or historical, and their men and women are sitting in the same hall. And was and this something that could happen? Yeah. And so in the mid-90s, you begin to see not only Ayatollah Sistani addressing these issues, but also recognizing there had to be, and I say it literally because that's the title of the book, okay. a code of practice for Muslims in the West. Right. It's as if, okay, if the customs of Najaf and Qum are customs which are related to uh, not allowing that mixing because of the conservativeness of some of the... Mm -hmm. Um, some of the groups or some of the leadership there. How about those who are living in London, those who are living in New York, those yeah. who are living in Sydney? Absolutely. And so it's not like Nejef hasn't been willing to address this issue. But we're finding that there are many situations living in the West where there are mixed gatherings going to occur. I go to a shopping center, these mixed gatherings are going to occur, for example. If I go to the beach, let's say I'm living, for example, in California or in Miami, yeah. mixed gatherings are going to occur. When I'm going to the gym, for example, mixed gatherings are going to occur. Okay. Yeah. So these questions suddenly begun to arise. Right. And I think that's the beauty of contemporary legal discussion. Like you said, mm. if Islam's dynamic, is it ready to find within its framework, are the jurists ready to find within the framework a recognition that the customs of one particular area, the urf right. of one particular area, is not necessarily the urf of another. No. Should urf be one? Is there a recognition at a certain time? The way you dress even changed. Of course. The way you put a beard and a moustache, did it resemble other communities even changed? And likewise, when it came to mixing, what was seen as appropriate, what was not? Right, yeah. right, alhamdulillah. There's a particular ayat in the Holy Quran. Uh, chapter 49, verse 13. Mm. Um, and I'm just paraphrasing. Uh, o mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female, from peoples, deferring tribes, that you may know one another. Mm. Now, the stereotype of that ayat often is quoted as um, having good akhlaq and perhaps you know, going towards marriage. Mm. But really, it should be broader than that, should it not? I mean, in terms of, for example, mixing in a halal environment, you've already mentioned about here, we're living in the West. How does it work for us? How can we accommodate certain things? Yeah. So for example, let me go straight into, for example, a, a, a marriage. What happens, for example, if one is invited to a secular marriage, a mixed marriage, where there is a number of people who are interacting, you know, mingling, um, how does one react to that? Should one go who is religious? Should one not go? Should one refrain? What sort of respect should be given as it were? Well, I don't have an issue with those people who come from other religions and have their practices when it comes to weddings. There's mm -hmm. no issue with that. But I think the main point is that if I'm going to go to that gathering, and I've been to, for example, a wedding of a, let's say, of a non-Muslim friend. Yeah. It's not obligatory on me to go. Right. But if I am going to attend, in many cases, you'll find either the friend will appreciate 
your coming and will recognize that, for example, on your table in that gathering, you may not necessarily uh, be in a position which allows that alcohol is on the table. Mm -hmm. They respect that. But then there's going to come other issues. The other issues that may arise, maybe, for example, that the mixing in that environment may lead to frivolity, may lead to lustful actions. Um, Vulgarity. People starting dancing with one another. And that's where Islam draws this line that, yes, we created you from male and female, mm -hmm. from different races and from different tribes in order that you get to know one another. Yeah. We don't want you to be strangers from one another. We don't want you to be in a situation where you never speak to each other. Sure. But we want you to be the most upright, moral individual. Right. You should be an exemplar, in which sense, an exemplar that you don't mingle with the same or the opposite gender in a way which becomes seen as being far from ethical. Okay, okay. Um, but how you draw that line becomes extremely delicate. Right, right. right. How do I maintain that line? Okay. Because if you're going to look, for example, in the examples in the Quran and the examples in the history of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, you'll find that there are instances where prophets, for example, are in a situation where they are with those who are not related to them necessarily. Mm -hmm. What then happens? How much do they interact? They don't say that we can't speak to that person. Right. But nor do they go to the other extreme where all of a sudden our God is completely Okay, so has the, has the Holy Quran alluded to the fact that, you know, there has been some sort of mixing or integration? Is there a particular ayat? Or? Well, I think if you're looking in the Holy Quran, you'll find in the story of uh, Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Okay. Prophet Moses with the daughters of Shu'aib. Right. And I think that particular incident in the Holy Quran is, is vital for us to understand Moses is wandering, wandering literally and wandering metaphorically, mm -hmm. wandering literally trying to find, you know, where he's heading in his life. Right. And wandering metaphorically at the same time, in the sense that he's seeing these two ladies. And these ladies are not related to him in any way. Okay. There's a clear mixing of the men and the woman over here trying to get some water. Uh -huh. And Moses notices that these ladies have been waiting patiently to get that water. But it seems that no one's telling them ladies first. Right. And Moses interjects. When he interjects, he asks them. And it shows that Islam doesn't have a problem with the male and female talking. Okay. There's no issue. Yeah. Okay, you're asking someone, you're seeing someone is in a, a spot of bother, and you ask them, what's the situation here? Mm -hmm. And they reply by saying that, you know, we're trying to get this water, as you see in the narrations. We're trying to get this water. Our father's an elderly man. Right. But it seems that nobody's offering them the chance to get that and water. And he's, he's being, sh you know... Showing chivalry, as it were, you know. Yeah, as in the chivalry being a composite of these moral mm. virtues are coming together. Yeah. Where he recognizes that I can help them. Yeah. You know, there's no issue in me helping them. And he helps them by getting this water for them. And also walking alongside them as they're heading home. Now, what's interesting is that he doesn't necessarily want to mingle with them the whole way home. Okay. He recognizes that, yes, we can have conversation. There's no harm. Yeah. But we'll also, for example, draw a line in the mixing that we have between us that we have to maintain our ethical responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so some narrations even say that he would have said to them, for them to point the direction as to how to get home, that some narrations even say that he would have told them, throw pebbles towards the direction. I see. I'll see where the, where the pebbles are heading. Right. So what he's doing here is he's showing a balance in the recognition of the mixed gathering. Alhamdulillah. I'm not saying don't talk to somebody in the community, but don't abuse yes. Yes. that verse that's telling you Absolutely. to get to know one another. Absolutely. And it's very interesting when they go home and tell their dad mm -hmm. about Moses' behavior, the first things that they recognized was not just that he was strong enough to get the water for them, but he was also someone who was extremely trustworthy. Right. I mean, okay. so they describe him by telling their dad that he should employ him. 
because the person you're going to employ is not just a man of great physique in terms of strength, but is also a man who was trustworthy. A man who's got these two ladies with him on a journey. He could have abused his position. Or he could have been extremely rude and not even spoken to us. Right, right. And I think that's where we're trying to find this that balance. balance. Yeah. That can we have gatherings in our communities mm. where neither is it a case of, oh, I put my head down, I cannot speak to you, sister, because if I look you in the eye, that's going to be the end of my life and I will be forever in the yeah. world of lust. Nor the other extreme where I've literally just turned up to this gathering just to see how many numbers I can get. Yeah, Which some, yeah. let's, let's face the facts. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I know that everybody wants to try and say that, well, you know, if it's a mixed gathering, not everybody is going to have perverted thoughts. You know, at, at, there are possibilities True. that a person can let themselves down. And there are other possibilities that there are people who are willing to entertain enjoying, um, you know, such moves because you're in that environment in some cases when you're, when you're giving me the example, let's say, of our, of our weddings, which we're going to come to shortly, mm -hmm. you're in that environment. That environment is, listen, you know, we're dressed in a certain way. You're dressed in a certain way. Yes. Don't just come and tell me um, how's the weather, you know, just yes. be able to elaborate a bit further. So what they're telling their dad, which eventually leads to the marriage okay. taking place between Nabi Musa alayhi salam and Shu'aib's uh, daughters, is that they're telling their dad, that this person, in terms of his moral conduct, mm. although he was mixing with those who are not necessarily maharam, maharam to him, but he maintained wonderful respect this whole time. Right, right. And I think that is a wonderful example, Quranically. Absolutely, that level of decorum, akhlaq, you know, is, is obviously one that we should obviously look for. How about if, for example, we have mosques that are clearly partitioned? Okay. So men sitting on one side, women sitting on the other. What does one say if, for example, women, uh, sisters are in hijab, can, it, can there be integration? Can they sit in the same hall? And so on and so forth. We've all, all, already spoken about, you know, for example, classrooms, men on one side, women on the other side. We attend universities here. How can we sort of bring it all together, as it were, if we are to say that it is dynamic? And that also actually relates further on into, for example, tournaments and sporting events? Well, when you're looking, for example, at the period of Hajj, that's the example yeah. most people give. Yeah. That since, you know, the, the beginning of the act of going to Hajj, as we know, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, went to one Hajj. And he said that one Hajj is an example for all of us. Mm. When he went on that one Hajj, no, did not tell us that the men and the woman, for example, cannot go on tawaf together. Right. And then you have the imams of Ahlul Bayt. And until today, when we go on Hajj, you've got the men and the woman clearly going round the Kaaba seven times. There is no partition for the men, no partition for the woman. No. And in many cases, when you're in that tawaf and Hajj, you find out that women are definitely stronger than men. Now, what happens there is that people begin to ask, okay, if in the holiest house, and I think it's a good argument, I do as well. If it's sure. in the holiest house in the religion yes. of Islam, yes. and you've got this situation where the Lord does not have a problem with men and women observing hijab, hijab. meaning social, social and physical. Phys yes. Agreed. Don't get me wrong, you can get perverts. Of course, absolutely. At Hajj. Yeah. And we've seen some very sad cases right. where, you know, even near what is seen as the symbol of God's house. You have some of the most perverted individuals. But people will then ask the question, what are the principles that you can gain from this? And the principles that you're clearly gaining is that if there is a mosque, like you're taking the example of Masjid al-Haram, if there is this mosque, this mosque, hijab is being observed by the men and the women. You know, this whole social hijab and mixed gatherings, men have as much of a role to play as the women do. Clearly, clearly. And... If that's being observed, then that can be taken on to other mosques. So, in 1996, mm -hmm. over 22 years ago, Ayatollah Sistani was asked this question. That we have a current method in relation to lectures. But how about if, for example, in our mosques we were to have seminars? Yeah. Or workshops? 
Sure. Or committee meetings. Mm -hmm. Would it be problematic for the men and the woman to be sitting in the same hall, not with a partition, but hijab is being observed? Yeah. Now, majalis-wise seems to always be problematic. So when you've got this person giving the lecture, and you've got, for example, the gents on the ladies' side, sometimes it's problematic because of logistics. Can you fit all the men or the women yeah, yeah. all in that, yeah. in that particular hall? Yes. Logistically, sometimes it's problematic. Yes, yes. Sometimes you may find even some woman who might turn around and say that I don't necessarily want to be on the men's side uh, because, for example, in the ladies' side, I want to take off my scarf mm. or I may have my kids or I may, for example, feel more relaxed and I feel I'm observing my or sitting, hijab. Yeah, or even sitting how... Or sitting comfortably. Comfortably. For example. Not so formally. But we cannot deny that there is also a generation of... of, of teenagers who will also turn around and say, well, I believe that looking at the speaker face to face mm. has more impact yes. than looking at them on a television on a screen. Television. That's right. Or Definitely. all of us being thrown like in some dungeon in a basement while the men sit in the, in yes. the nicer yeah. hall. Just with now, the TV. Mm. Exactly. Now, if we go back to Ayatollah Sistani, when he's asked this question, that if we're going to have, for example, seminars, workshops, all of them he replied clearly by saying, as long as hijab is being observed, then there is no problem for the men and the woman to interact with one another, to voice their opinions in front of one another. Okay. okay. There's no harm. That you're able to have that interaction. Mm -hmm. This is a religious workshop. Right. And I wish that sometimes we would think a better bit, of our people. A bit broader as well. Broader and also give more benefit of the doubt to yeah, our people. It's yeah. always as if people think negatively about our, you know, members of our community, as if they're all going to be, you know... Hypocritical. Hypocritical or, you know, the worst when it comes to these gatherings. I personally believe, and I've voiced this many times, that when we have seminars at our mosques, I believe the ladies and the gents sitting side by side, yeah. listening to the lecturer, and then a lovely question and answer session yeah. taking place. There's no harm whatsoever. It's actually more interactive. Um, yes. Definitely. Someone might say, okay, but wait. You do that seminar and you've got the ladies and the gents, let's say, for example, sitting with one another. When they're leaving, the whole discussion changes. They're going to start talking about other things. Mm. I reply by saying, is that always problematic? When they're leaving and discussing other areas, why is it we always look at it negatively? Why is it that they're only going to discuss things which are always seem to be, well, look at those two talking. For all you know, <laughs> they're talking because there's a problem that that person may be facing. There's a difficulty. There's an injustice and they need someone's support. Yeah, sure. Now, I do agree that if you're looking at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, there would be a situation where he would make sure that one of the genders completely leaves the mosque right. and then the other one leaves. Okay, okay. Rather than both leaving at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah. Now that could be a precautionary measure. Mm. Mm. Um, but I think when it comes to our centers, even those who don't observe, let's say ladies who don't literally wear the head Pitch covering, yeah. when they're coming to the mosque, a lot of them show the best respect. Yes, and, and And therefore I think on that level, there shouldn't be an issue with seminars, with workshops, with our youths and our elders all sitting together mm -hmm. in the mosque, voicing their opinions on a particular issue. Because otherwise we're going to end up honestly losing some of our youth. Absolutely, absolutely. A hundred percent. Alhamdulillah, thank you for that. I actually remember my first visit to Karbala um, in 2002. And I remember very fondly going to uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam's shrine. Mm. And there wasn't a partition at that time. Men and women could actually pray mm. just near the dhari, as it were. Mm. And so it was, it was actually wonderful, and I don't think there was hypocrisy. So in my mind, it can work as well, as you've mentioned as well. Um, now let's move on to, for example, are there any... Just so that we can actually throw it out there for the audience, especially for sisters. In... Are there any rulings or fatwas around, for example, women being able to um, dance amongst themselves? Um, 
what what does Islam say about that? I mean, after all, if women also say, well, I'm in my own environment, I'm in my own comfort zone, I'm not doing anything wrong, it's just us, I want to take hijab off, because obviously it's partition. What, what are the sort of rulings behind that? Is, is that... Well, Ayatollah Sistani finds it problematic. Woman right. dancing in front of woman, and men dancing in front of men. Mm. Um... Some will say, well, this is a wonderful occasion. Yeah. And therefore you should allow us. And they may refer to other scholars, you know, before Ayatollah Sistani, like Ayatollah al khoi and others, they may refer to their opinions. Uh, but you find that sometimes this can even go overboard. Yeah, sure. Um, when it comes to men dancing in front of men or women dancing in front of women, now, I don't want to be like a party pooper and ruins everyone's weddings or everyone's uh, happy occasions. But there are some people who, when it comes to a wedding, I think it's an excuse in some cases to just let everything let out. Go. Just let, let yourself go. Yeah, yeah. A Muslim really doesn't have that situation. Right. Or doesn't have that need in reality that they have to let themselves go. Mm -hmm. um, some ladies will say, well, you know what? There are no men here. Yeah. So why can't we dance amongst each other? But even dancing amongst each other... Yes. I can't remember any tradition from the ladies of Ahl al-Bayt. If we're going to take them as prime role models, mm -hmm. I can't remember any of them saying that I'd be delighted if all of you would dance for me or get the dancers here. It's Fatima al-Zahra and Imam Ali's wedding. Now some will say, but I'm just happy for my son. He's got married. Or I'm happy for my daughter and I just want to let myself go a bit. And I think that the Muslim should always be someone who tries to maintain their morals as much as mm. they can. Some have even resulted in, in playing music in the weddings. Right. And the reason they're playing that music is also because it will encourage that dancing. Yeah. And some of that dancing also can reach a level <coughs> where, you know... Um, that behavior is not necessarily representative of the, of the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt. And I don't think we should ever be in a situation where we let ourselves go. Right. There always needs to be a moral uprightness. Mm, absolutely. You know, religiosity is not this thing, well, I pray, I fast, I pray, I fast. Praying and fasting is not difficult. You've got to fast 30 days in the year, and you've got to pray five times a day, in some cases like a speed train or the fastest car. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to always be at the top of your spirituality. So mm -hmm. I think it's in moments like this that a person particularly shows their spirituality. Yes, yes. Um, do they let themselves go? Well, I've seen cases now. Forget woman dancing in front of woman or men dancing in front of men. I've seen cases now where the groom may come to the lady's side of a wedding and he's dancing with his wife, and not just dancing, may even kiss his wife in front of everybody. And I know that there may be non-Muslims who watch this and, and see that there's no issue there. But you find that, Islamically speaking, once again, there is that chivalry word that you mentioned mm, earlier. Mm, mm. Um, and let alone when you see um, some, in some cultures, you'll find the husband and the wife dancing in a way in front of all his friends. Now, let's be very frank about this, okay. if you don't mind. When you two are getting married, and your missus is in her finest, mm -hmm. in some cases, you'll find that there are, there are ladies who um, will not come to that stage of dancing with their husband in front of their friends. And nor will they even show their face on that day to his friends. No. Because they recognize that with all the makeup on and so on, it may not be the appropriate, appropriate thing. But then you'll find that there are some men with the wife. The two will be going at it. Yes. Dancing with his friends all around. Yep. Watching her move. That's right. Now, either she's completely forgotten herself at that moment... Or she needs to come to the quick realization that those guys who are watching you dance in that way, we don't look at you as, oh, you know, she's my mate's um, wife, you know, that's amazing. No, no, I can see you grinding. Mm. I can see your hips moving. 
I can see you're wearing the finest clothing and most figure hugging. Yes. So when I'm seeing you move like that, I'm either looking at you in a way where I'm thinking that, you know what, this way that I'm looking at her, she's looking amazing, or some will even backbite and may look and say, what type of relationship do these two have? What type of scarf is being observed? And therefore, this is something that has to be reassessed. True. When it has to be reassessed, it has to be reassessed in our communities that where is this mixing leading us? Where my friends can look at my wife grinding mm. on me. I, and I'm not going to use any more words because I'm already in enough trouble using certain language when I speak about certain issues. And so you are asking women dancing in front of women and men dancing in front of men. Now it's become a case where, you know, the groom and the wife, all of a sudden the wife is just like, listen, yes. let's dance in front of everybody. Exactly. I don't care if your mates are looking at me dancing or moving my hips or moving other parts of my body in that way. Let's just enjoy this. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, those who are calling for the mixed gatherings to happen, as... We said, let them happen in our mosques. Maintain and observe the etiquette of morality. But how is it suddenly transferred into certain gatherings where completely the hijab has gone missing? Mm -hmm. And some of these families who may be involved in the mixing, in these weddings and these occasions, some of these families are families who will go hajj. Hajj is always a good tick to have on your CV. You know, um, it gives you that feeling of, not just religiosity, so but whatever haram you've done in the year, you always feel that, you know what, I've just cleaned it up. Yeah. Um, and some of these will be very charitable people. But with all of that, there still needs to be maintained a moral upright. Absolutely. If you're Absolutely. looking within the scholarly discussions that have taken place, you'll find that always the scholars are not saying it's haram for a man and a woman to be talking to one another mm -hmm. or haram for a man or woman to for example sit next to one another but there may be certain situations where it can become on the secondary level something forbidden there are traditions where imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam so, talks to the people of iraq that you the men and the woman are rubbing you know you're, you're rubbing themselves on each other now rubbing themselves on each other what does that mean that means the mingling has got so much it's too close. That you're, you're too close now. And I think we have to be careful that when you're having any of these occasions, how close are we getting? Yeah. Even if you're covered up from head to toe, was that enough? Mm -hmm. Where you're literally an inch or two away from, from having that lady and that man literally just all over each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? And, and by the way, that touching does take place. Let's be very clear yeah, about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think that if we're, we don't want to hide these things, but that touching does take place where you're at a mixed gathering, inadvertently, you know, you do have a guy who's going to brush, mm -hmm. and he's not just going to brush your shoulder. Let's not be around the bush here as well. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes he's going to brush across the chest of the girl. Sometimes the girl may want to come and take a picture with the guy and half her chest is sticking next to him. You know, and, 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 and so what begins to happen is the laws of social hijab have gone. Mm. Physical, yeah, they might be covering their hair, for example. Sure, sure. Um, and they're covering the rest of their body. But then that social hijab is where it becomes uh, problematic. Right, okay. Thank you for that. What about, there's a question for you. How about if, um, for example, someone's cousin's getting married and it's a mixed wedding, should one go or should one decline? <coughs> and what, and uh, naturally, it would obviously relate to what sort of wedding it is. But let's, like you said, let's put it out there. Sometimes the wedding being mixed is not the issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, say for example, you have these tables and people are getting married and you've got tables with your family. I think there are secondary issues that emerge from that mixing. Uh, secondary issues may be that music begins to be played and that music which is not something which is seen as ethical. Right. That music where people will start getting up and dancing to that music. And you know, at that moment, it's your responsibility to politely uh, decline. Right. Politely in the sense that, you, you know, this is not necessarily a gathering that I may be um, allowed to stay in. I've been. Okay. 
I've been to uh, mixed weddings. And not as someone who, for example, is reciting the nikah or something. <laughs> you know, I've been to mixed weddings, but there would have to be a moment where I excuse myself, for example. Yeah. Um, because I believe that where it's heading may be something which Islamically is not acceptable. Right. Okay. Uh, but you'll find that with a lot of these mixed weddings, even if it's your cousin who's invited you, it's not obligatory a, to attend one's cousin's wedding. It's not the end of the world. No. Uh, B, there is also no harm in you, for example, sending a nice gift to your cousin to maintain that salah between mm. you, that relation. Mm. But I think further than that, if you feel that that gathering can become something immoral, then you have to begin to ask yourself whether the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first and foremost or maintaining relations with your cousins. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think there's an easy winner there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not going to say that every single mixed wedding that there is out there is necessarily a bad wedding or an immoral wedding. Mm -hmm. I believe that there are certain weddings where there's no music being played, which is immoral. There's no dancing happening. Okay. There's a nice small talk being given yeah, sure. by one of the scholars who will remind the responsibilities, the rights, the roles of the husband and the wife. And the people are having a nice dinner with one another. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's black and white. Yeah where people begin to think that every wedding is immoral if there is mixing. Yes. You know, it's not like that. I think that there are many families out there who observe hijab in the sense um, in that mixed wedding. But where the scholars will talk mm. is the precautionary measure. Why right. do we need to go down that route? Of course. The precautionary measure is why don't the men sit on one side, and the ladies sit on another, for side. example. And the ladies can enjoy themselves, not only enjoy themselves, you know, you find some ladies who go out shopping for a wedding, um, and then when they want to wear what they've bought, for example, when it's mixed, they have to think a million times. Mm. Is can this, I wear this? Can, uh, can I, not? I wear this? Can I not wear this? Is this sticking out? Is this holding in? Is this guy looking? Is yeah. that guy looking? It's not fair. <laughs> for us guys, of course, it's much easier. But I think then when you have ladies on one side and guys on the other, the ladies can be relaxed. Yes, yes. You know, and some might get frustrated that, well, I've bought this dress and the only people appreciating it are ladies. Mm. Well, I could see where you're coming from. Um, that maybe you wanted a few guys to appreciate what you're wearing. But don't worry, you know. Appreciation, God's appreciation is absolutely, high. Inshallah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to go to a break in the next moment or two. Uh, and then after the break, we'll discuss marriage as well. Just before that, um, there's a perception sometimes of people thinking, well, you know, if I go to that wedding, Maulana is going to be sitting there, maybe boring, and so on and so forth. And clearly, it's to do with the mindset and the culture. Um, but this is quite an important issue because even within families there are you know different levels as it were of spirituality and so on and so forth so what can we very briefly mention to the audience and then we'll come back after the break and then talk about marriage and how boys and girls can mix as well is there an environment for them to mix for, with a view to marriage so on and so forth so now what would you just say very briefly about that well i believe this whole wedding thing has been exaggerated you know mm -hmm. this whole idea of letting loose and you know we need dancing, we need mixing, we need to let ourselves go. I think it's all exaggerated. I don't think it's... And we evolve into such understanding sometimes, but I don't think in the origin of Islam, weddings were meant to be um, going towards any direction which could lead to immorality. Mm -hmm. In many cases, I think the weddings that we hold, the people we invite, in many cases, we look back and we're thinking, well, wish 90% of those people weren't there. And in yeah. some cases, I wish I hadn't necessarily spent that much money on that occasion um, but then certainly I appreciate that there are people who can do this with a moral upright manner um, and so you know we don't want to generalize on everyone and no, even if you no. do see that there are some family members who may for example say well this is boring if the Maulanas mm. are there or if there's no music there or if we, uh, the guys and girls can't mingle 
then you know, give them benefit of the doubt. Give yeah. them time. Don't you know? Don't attack them too harshly. Okay. Okay. Viewers, do call in uh, for your questions. The telephone number is o two o three five one five o one double nine. Once again, o two o three five one five o one double nine. You can also text or WhatsApp your questions. Four four o seven nine three nine nine one seven one six three. Once again, four four o seven nine three nine nine one seven one six three. See you again in the next moment or two, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV where we're discussing the topic of mixed gatherings, the law and the cultural clash as it were. Assalamu alaikum Sayyidina. Wa alaikum assalam wa Welcome back to tonight's live show. Um, just going straight into it now. Um, the question has come up is regards to what would be the ideal wedding planning system as it were or format. What would you say to that as it were? Probably try and invite as little guests as possible, really. Okay. Um, I, you know, as I said, I think even if you're going to have a, you know, you're going to have a wedding, there's no harm having a small dinner where your relatives and the bride's relatives, for example, are together. This whole elaboration where, you know, we all need to get up and dance and so on. I just think that these are things which have been introduced that don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. I think you can maintain a moral uprightness with something extremely basic and extremely low key. That's not going to deny that there aren't people out there who may have something which is extravagant or elaborate um, and have their family amongst them. Yeah. But I think if you are sitting there and you're planning for your wedding, you invite a couple of your friends um, the bride invites a couple of friends, you've got the families there, and you've got, you know... Small, intimate gathering. Intimate, and also put some spirituality mm. there. Now, some of that spirituality may not be something that is going to make the most exciting scene for you to put on Snapchat to tell the whole world that, look at us guys, we're going nuts over here. Um, but what you'll have is when you have, for example, Hadith al kisa being recited, when you have a small talk being given as a reminder, when you have the Qur'an being recited, and then after that the night ends, you know, it's further elaboration and going further in terms of making everybody feel like this is an amazing night, I don't think necessarily needs to be there. And I think we've even seen examples, you know, I remember when we used to hold lectures in, in London, you know, years okay. back, when I used to speak, for example, on Friday nights yeah. on some occasions, uh, we used to have these uh, programs in just off Edgware Road. So, you know, just one yep. second. We've got a caller on the line, and inshallah, we'll revert back yep. immediately. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sister, your question, please. Um, my question is just regarding um, about going to the gym. For example, for women, um, obviously, it is good to be healthy and this day and age. And I wanted to know what the sales views are on this because obviously when you go to a gym there is men and women training there so what is his view on that and how you know we can deal with us women who want to go to the gym and there may not be an availability of a ladies only gym once again um i think it applies to men as much as women mm -hmm. i think i think sisters asking this question um uh, that you know what do we do if there isn't a ladies only gym uh, but likewise, I think a lot of the problems faced in, in the world of the gyms is the men's eyes, you know, yeah, because sure. the gym does allow you to see some of the most stunning bodies in the world. And um, when you're in there, it's very hard to focus on the, on the press-up and the apparatus, or and, the apparatus yeah. and so mm -hmm. on and getting those dumbbells and so on because, you know, you, you yourself are looking around and you're seeing some of the most beautiful ladies who have looked after themselves so I think for men and for women it's problematic. For ladies, for example, um, if, if they're able to go to a ladies-only gym, then that is, of course, 
uh, very, very beneficial for them in terms of the uh, modesty. But you'll find that even the maraja, when it comes to gents going to mixed gyms, um, okay. it is really frowned upon. Right. Um, unless a person is able to maintain their, their uh, lowering of the gaze, um, extremely difficult. Okay. But if you are able to maintain it, um, or, you know, there are now great rules because of the Me Too campaign. Where in the past, you know, there are guys who were able to look at um, everything that moved and make perverted comments. But now with Me Too, you could be in trouble all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so maybe it's a helpful era. Yeah. Uh, but for those ladies who cannot find a ladies only gym, a gym is not something which is obligatory within the religion of Islam. No, so it's not... No. Uh, not something that I have to go to the gym therefore, because I will not survive, therefore I have to find a gym somewhere. No, the ladies only gym will be uh, what is preferred. Otherwise, you go to the mixed gyms, whether you like it or you don't, one way or the other, it opens the doors. doors. And this applies to the men as well. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at Ayatollah Sistani's ruling on this, um, also for the men as well. Right. That these places are very much not recommended if a person knows that they will fall into sin. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, Dr. Sayonamar, you were just um, briefly, just before the phone call, you were talking about, you know, gathering, weddings should be, you know, there shouldn't be a fuss about it, there shouldn't be elaboration, you know, it should be intimate as it were. Um, just going back to that, you know, so what else should be we, what, sh what else should be looking for as it were um, to have that sort of promotion as it were of spirituality in a, in a, in a nice ethical quiet environment is there anything else that we should be actually looking for maybe you be charitable on that day yeah, yeah, you know yeah. um charitable not just maybe being generous when it comes to the food that you're serving mm -hmm. but also donate a certain amount to a particular fund or yes. a particular trust you know, these these aspects are what make your union a spiritual one i was saying about for example the you know when we were lecturing in the iraqi community years back and I I remember we were giving these lectures off Edgware Road in central London okay. and there were some families who started to attack us by saying that we give lectures to youths near a road which is known for maybe some okay. immorality. Right. I found it ironic that when mm -hmm. an Iraqi wedding finished the same people who were attacking us were in cars uh, you know, beeping the, the, the horns as you, as you do at the end of a, a wedding ceremony with cars following each other. Yeah. yeah. Where? On Edgewa Road. Now you're attacking us for having those lectures at Edgewa Road, but now you're in these cars, girls and guys jumping out of the cars. Enacting it. And the behavior leaves a lot to be desired when you're seeing these guys and girls who are meant to be moral upright people mm -hmm. now even laughing and joking with each other in a way where all the boundaries of hijab are gone yeah. so some will say but you don't understand if that's not there then we've not had a good night give me a break we don't need these things to have a good night yeah you've been desensitized to some of the teachings of the religion and therefore you are told that unless the gatherings allow this to happen then it's going to be something extremely boring otherwise. No, we don't need to go down that route. Yeah. That route can result in certain um, acts which are far from Islamic. Right. Okay, just to keep this topic in context, as it were, and give some more depth. Can students have events um, in university Ahlubayt societies in mixed environments? Yes, I think of course they can. Um, and I, I think it's great for them to have these events. And I repeat what Ayatollah Sistani had said right from the beginning. That is that when you're having these seminars and there is this hijab that's being observed, yeah. our students are amazing at university. Our students have done amazing work, amazing programs, amazing seminars. Like if I look at, for example, I, I lectured for the King's Ahl al-Bayt Society recently uh, at, uh, at King's College London. And mm -hmm. And it was a mixed crowd. Well, it's yeah. a university crowd. You're not the one who's in charge of that setting. No. You know, um, so it's a university setting. There are students everywhere. And they, they were fantastic. So there's no harm there because 
You're not going towards organizing something where there is frivolity or, no, or no, sinful acts. Not. You're organizing something which allows people to learn about the religion, religion. or to remove the misconceptions. Yes. So um, them getting together and working in committees, <clears throat> organizing events, as long as they're observing their social and physical hijab, what's the problem? And I hope that they may find their future partners in these events. Yes. Because yes. I think one thing that we're discounting is... Who will our sons and daughters Daughters. get married to if they're not allowed to come together when they're organizing these wonderful events? Mm. So if in our mosques we don't allow these seminars for the the brothers and sisters to come and sit together, then who are they going to find out in the community? Who can they get married to? It's in these types of gatherings that they may see someone who's their future partner. Absolutely. And we lost, we lost a number of people who may have, for example, either not got married or got married to somebody who in Islamic law it's not necessarily acceptable mm-hmm. because they said that we didn't know the guys in our communities, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so, yes, um, it's quite an important thing. We've got a question um, via WhatsApp. Um, just to remind viewers again, do call in 0203 515 Also, WhatsApp your te- questions, 440739. 917163. Asalaamu Alaikum Sayyidina. I know it's not related, but my name is Hassan Khan. I am 17 years old. First of all, I would like to say thank you for inspiring me. Listening to your re- lectures really inspired me to learn more about Islam. I am, I don't mean to brag, really just sheer teen who is being bullied by his family, including my mum and dad, cousins, etc. They encourage me to take part in haram acts like relationships and go clubbing. They say just to pray. I go to the library every day and listen to Islamic lectures and try to follow many things Ahlul Bayt Islam guide us to do, including daily lifestyle. And I try praying mustahab prayers sometimes. I'm trying to give up my worldly desires. I feel stressed because of my family. What do you suggest I do in this difficult position? Well, the companions of the <coughs> Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, face these situations. Yeah. Where they may have had family members who were blocking them from going on the path of the religion of Islam. And this is a period of patience for you. Uh, Don't lash out on your family. Don't be rude towards them. Um, There will be your time for your independence. Right. But for the time being, try and show the best akhlaq back. Okay. Um, I cannot envy anyone who faces a situation where their family mocks them for getting closer to God. And there are people out there who sadly have to face this, that their families actually mock them by saying you're praying too much, you're fasting. Mm. I know some mm. girls out there who, when they wore the hijab, their yeah. families were like, why are you wearing why? this? You look ugly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Take it yeah. off. Yeah. Maintain your patience in these moments. Right. Allah is with those who are patient. patient. And have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what Imam Zain al Abidin asks of him in Dua Makaram al Akhlaq, wa abdilni min bogdati ahl al shan'an al mahabba. Oh Allah, change the hatred um, of my enemies into love for me. You know, sometimes we straight away want to condemn them by saying they're evil, they're the worst. Read the dua that Allah rotates their heart. Mm-hmm. The reason the heart is known as the qalb, taqallub, it's always ready Rotation. to rotate. Hur bin Yazid al his heart suddenly rotated in one moment. Whereas there were others whose hearts rotated to other directions. Mm. So try and pray for your family okay. that God guides them. And you know, there are cases, I remember Ammar bin Yasser being a prime example of someone whose family, Yasser and Sumayya, were against his conversion to the religion of Islam at the beginning. And then later on became the first martyrs in the religion. Right. Yeah. Okay. Shukran. Thank you for that. Just um, continuing on the topic of Islamic universities, um, perhaps what are what are the views around boys and girls studying together in libraries? Um, is it guys? Uh, what well, are, the guys, what, the guys are, are there to get the attention of the girl, and the girls there to study. Yeah. 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 So I must admit, and maybe you know, I'm speaking from someone as. As, um, as conniving as myself. But I would say that um, 
When girls and guys are studying at a library, the guy in many cases is thinking, how can I get the girl's number? How can I get in her good books? Because I'm spending hours listening to what could be her studies. Also, what could be the emotions that she's going through or the problems that she's going through. And the girl in many cases is, is innocently believing that the guy is... She's receptive. Study. She's thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you've either got the... Yeah, so you've either got the girls with the nerdy friend yeah. who's going to give you all the answers. Yeah. Or the friend that you just take with you to the library because you just need a guy there as a chaperone. Or you know, good-looking, cool guys. Um, and Islamically speaking, look, if you guys are all studying at uni together, there is nothing which is a stronger voice to your morality and to correct your right and wrong than your own conscience. Mm. Now, I can give lectures all day long, but when the conscience speaks to you and says, listen, you and her are studying together. It's about 3 a.m. now and you're alone in this library. What's the need? <laughs> and in some cases, the poor girl's thinking to herself, you know what, this guy's such a nice guy. He stayed with me the whole night and that guy's just thinking other things. And, mm. um, and I think, you know, you have to maintain the social hijab. So Islam, once again, Moses spoke to them. He didn't say, I'm not speaking to you. Nor did he speak to them non-stop. There was a nice balance that he had. Yes, yes. And I think that Moses type, you know, message can be incorporated practically at the universities that sit okay. together in your study groups. And if you are studying chemistry 101, maths 101, economics 101, then all cool. But if the discussion then suddenly goes that, how do you think this top looks? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, looks on me at the moment, then a person has to maybe at that moment begin to reflect that, okay, where Something is this now on, heading? Yeah. Can yeah. we? Now, some people, you know, listen, some people it's just part of conversation and they maintain their respect, but others have to reflect. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, just to elaborate, we've got another question here as well come through, and it's actually one that I was going to ask you before, so I may as well put it for you. Um, in terms of <coughs> further elaborating on the recreational aspects, swimming pools as it were, and how they, how people actually mingle there. Is it, you know, what, what are the sort of... It's, it's problematic, you know, again, yeah. again, you're looking at the verdicts of the maraja, and it's always frowned upon, you know, being on mixed beaches. Because look, you're going there, you want to have a nice swim in the beach, you're looking around you, and in many cases, you've got some of you know, the most beautiful bikini-clad women walking there. And it really is difficult to maintain mm -hmm. that you know, upright morality. Like we're saying that, okay, a beach is not an area you can control. Our weddings, maybe we have a bit more control on it, yeah, therefore yeah. there's a bit more responsibility. Yeah. But you can certainly, uh, it's not obligatory for you to be on that beach. beach. And if you feel that you're going to end up you know, committing acts of corruption. And look, we've all been there. You know, I, yeah, I love yeah. going to the beach and I love to be um, on the sand. But you could be sitting there staring at the water and then all of a sudden, you got someone absolutely beautiful walking past and, you know, they say that the first look's allowed. There are many guys, that first look is one look which is extended for about one minute because he's thinking, have you seen how stunning she looks? Yes. And so I think it's a bit hypocritical then of us when we're talking about mixing that occurs and then we find ourselves on beaches mm -hmm. where even though you may not end up going to you know, necessarily talk to that person who's not mahram to you, yeah. being there could lead you to that. Likewise with swimming pools. True. You'll find that sometimes someone might show me a verdict which says as long as you know that you're not going to fall into corruption mm -hmm. when you're going to the pool. And I think many pools that you'll go to you're not going to fall into corruption. You, know, you may be a member of a prestigious health club and uh, everyone's really minding their own business. Um, but I think there are certain cases where you may go to a pool in a certain resort where you look around you and you're wondering, uh, how the hell am I going to maintain my uh, focus over here? Mm -hmm. um, and then when that happens, you have to begin to really reassess your own hijab. Okay. Um, now, there's, an, there's quite a few questions actually here now. Um, Salam, I have a question for the live show. <coughs> If people, if people mix gathering, well, I'm reading it again. If people mix in a gathering with cousins, of which some are married and some are unmarried and younger, 
They play board games and have discussions together as families do. What is the ruling on this? And also wearing burkinis in front of cousins or any men as it, Burkini, does it, show, yeah. does it, show, as it shows a body shape. What is the ruling on this? So there's yeah. two parts. Sir. Well, bikini in front of cousin, in front of man. Man, while God, you know, gifted him what he gifted him, I don't care if it's bikini or not, you're still looking at the shape of that body. Mm -hmm. In some cases, inside you, you may be thinking, mm, you know what, she looks amazing, but I'm not going to say it. And in other cases, you may end up saying it. And in other cases, it may lead you to even saying more than that. So, wearing that bikini because you want to have a swim... But then you're going to go and sit with your husband's mates or your brother's mates wearing that bikini and you've just come out of that water all wet. I don't know. I, let's be realistic. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We're two realistic. guys sitting here and I'm a guy who gets in a lot of trouble anyway. But I just, I'm just going to be very frank. Like, you know, in such cases, you're still looking at the person and the shape of their bodies Body. and so on. And mind you, there are even people within the Muslim communities Husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife, all sitting on a, uh, by the as pool. As couples, yes. Yeah. As couples, yeah, even yeah. with bikinis yeah, on. Yeah. Forget bikini. 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 <laughs> bikini. <laughs> and sometimes the men are the ones who are telling the wives that, look, you have to observe hijab. And he's sitting there, not wearing a top in front of his, uh, in front of his wife's friends. Friend, yeah. Um, so already that mixed gathering has been destructive, you know. Now, in terms of cousins... I tell you once again, it depends on backgrounds. You know, if you're looking, for example, at some cultures, the Lebanese, for example, it's extremely normal. Okay. Extremely normal for mixing to happen where, you know, um, men, women sitting, laughing, cigarettes, the shishas in the hands. And in many cases, there's no lustful or frivolous or bad intention. Right. They're all sitting there. It's really, just really, they find it so normal. Right. It's unbelievable. Okay. You know, like okay. you can have the most stunning girl walk in, and the guy's like, well, you know what? She's just like my sister. Right. <laughs> Whereas you'll find that there's other cultures where it just reaches a stage. I, I know, for example, even when you look at some of my Iranian friends, okay. they were able to mix with one another and they're like, oh, she's my friend, or she's just my friend, or she's just my friend. And it just became a normal, normal case, case that 20, 30 of them could just sit there with no lustful intention, where it was just the case of, oh, you don't understand, she's not my friend. Yeah, but bro, so you're not one bit attracted to, no, I just see her like my younger sister. What younger sister? Yeah. As in, yeah. Look, look, look what she's wearing. So there are certain cultures where the mixing even made them immune yeah, yeah. from become, feeling anything. They've become desensitized. Desensitized. Totally. I don't think an Iraqi can ever be desensitized, by the way. Right. And I'm not speaking from experience, <laughs> although the cameraman is laughing right now. But I don't think I don't think an Iraqi can ever be desensitized. I think like we were just born to be protective. Good word. <laughs> good word. Good word. I think I need to, you know, take from your wisdom when it comes to language. But, you know, there are some cultures which baffle me, really, absolutely baffle me, where they find it normal to mix and, and it's as if there's no lustful intention whatsoever. You can have five guys sitting there, five girls sitting there, and some who don't necessarily wear what is seen as the classic hijab, but they are lovers of Ahl al-Bayt and so mm -hmm. on. And the guy, you know, is just sitting there very normally as if not affected one bit. Yeah, amazing. Okay, next question. Um, should you visit the home of family members where they do not observe social hijab, instead find it acceptable <coughs> to be touchy? We have a friend of ours, we call him <laughs> Hagchi. Hagchi. Okay. Because he will literally hug everything that moves and he will say, she's like my sister. I'm like, bro, everybody's your sister. He's like, but you don't understand. It. Every single person is a sister. Now, if you're going to a cousin's house, and you know, some non-Muslim viewers may look at this and think, what are these law on? Yeah. Like, you know, are you serious? This is your cousin. The Muslim non-Muslim viewers to understand, the Muslim Muslims can marry absolutely anything that moves, except for you know what is mm -hmm. what is commonly known, and and so 
even if you have a family member's house who you go to who, you know, let's say she's my cousin and she wants to come and hug me, there is no problem. And actually, it's a duty on you to say no. Yeah. Okay. And once you've said no, politely, then it's not to be repeated again. Now, someone might say, well, I have my uncle's wife. Now, we know uncle's wife still cannot touch you. No. Someone might say, I've got my uncle's wife and she is now 68 years old and she wants to come and hug me. Even the Iraq is allowed to hug that one. And what I mean by that is they're past, they're past the, uh, the time of hijab okay. at this stage. You okay. know, it, it, it's a bit more. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I would hope. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Salam Hussein Zadeh from North London. Is it permissible for a Shia Muslim girl to wear a dress to a mixed gathering? And what dress codes apply to both Shia <coughs> men and women who are attending mixed gathering? Thank you. Well, she, she can wear whatever, you know, she, she can decide to wear something. Right. Um, but if she really thinks that the guys aren't checking out what she's wearing, it's very hard to wear something in a mixed gathering, which is proper hijab, unless you're wearing the, you know, unless you're wearing something loose fitting or, you know, the abaya that they wear in the Emirates, for example, which is always mm -hmm. looking classy, mm -hmm. wherever it is. Very elegant, yeah. Very elegant. SubhanAllah, how, how something you'd think which covers everything ends up to be, in some cases, the most elegant. Um, but yeah, she can wear something. And there are many who go to these mixed weddings and they're wearing a hijab. But, you know, they're trying their hardest to cover their backside and trying their hardest to cover their chest area and they're trying to wear something and I, does it do the job I, I don't know yeah I think from from my um, understanding some people um, find certain laws difficult to follow let's be honest mm. and they choose they pick and choose what they want to follow interesting interesting and also based on you know the feeling of well my knee is is clean and therefore I'm not doing anything I'm just sitting there observing and yeah. Do you know who I respect the most? I have a lot of respect for those who are wearing hijab from our sisters who are part of a family structure that doesn't wear at all. Yeah. yeah. So, because I feel sorry for them because in, in every single photo, mm -hmm. they literally, in some cases, are the only ones who are wearing. Yes, yes. And for that. them to maintain that, you know, wearing that while the rest of the family has no interest, yeah, yeah. you've got to give them a lot of respect. You know, yes. I can sit here and say, well, you shouldn't be mixing and you mixing could end up, um, you know, uh, taking you to something which is not moral. <laughs> Them being part of a family where everybody just, in some cases, mocks you if you're wearing a scarf or just tells you blatantly, I'm never going to wear. Yeah, sure. For a sister or a sister-in-law, someone to wear. Okay. That is phenomenal. Okay, we've got just under five minutes. Salam, Sayed, what are your recommendations on, a women, on women reciting Qasidas, praising the Aima in a respectable mixed gathering? Good question there. Do it, do it. Yeah. I'm all for it. Okay. Yeah, I'm all for it. I think in many cases this is culture. Right. That stops our sisters from giving lectures to men or from reciting Qasidas in front of men. Look, there's a problem if someone's reciting in a in a melodious voice, something with frivolous or sinful mm -hmm. words and so mm -hmm. on, but, or words which lead to sin. But in terms of a um, qasida or a noha, marthiya, in a matam for Ahl al Bayt, for example, um, there's no harm. Right. And we should have a lot more who are reciting and we should be praising them a lot more. Inshallah. Sayyid, how about texting the opposite genders <coughs> on social media? who is not related or even if they are cousins. However, the chat becomes full of jokes. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's a fine line. Fine, fine line uh, it yeah. certainly is because you're having that banter um, with one another. But I think there are some who are mature enough mm -hmm. to make it clear um, when to draw a line. Um, but always one has to be beware. It doesn't matter how religious you look. You can always be somebody who's affected by such things. Okay. And you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. Okay. Asalaamu Alaikum. I am engaged and I'm wondering if I'm allowed to hang out or go on a date with my fiance. If you are doing mut'a with one another or there is a nikah being recited, 
then you can, otherwise you can't. Right, okay, so that's the answer there. Um, I think perhaps we've got just a couple of minutes and uh, I just perhaps would like you to summarise what, where we should be actually heading towards. And maybe, maybe we should <coughs> extend this topic again, inshallah. Yeah, I think um, mosques-wise, I'm a big advocate that we have more seminars, tutorials, workshops, Mm -hmm. where brothers and sisters interact because I think there is so much to benefit from the sisters in our community who in many cases we do not hear their voices. Okay. Uh, I think weddings wise, I think some of us just have to take a little step back and begin to ask ourselves if I was to look at the video of my behavior, mm -hmm. is that something morally upright? Okay, we've got just time for one question. And then we'll immediately end uh, saying after. Salam alaikum, Dr. Nakshwani. Thank you for the work you do. I have a question. My potential spouse has a problem. He is overly friendly with females at his educational setting. He has great desire to be polygamous, but the reason he isn't is because in our contract, he can only be with myself. Mm. What advice do you have for me as a female? How do I deal with him when he can't help but free mix? Must I allow him to do mudah? So it's halal for him to behave like this? Or is it my right to expect him to be loyal plus lower his gaze? How should he deal with this problem of great sexual, great desire sexually, Shukran? I think that's a very sensitive moment in the relationship. And mm. I think you've got to make it clear to your husband. Right. Either there is a change of ways or the relationship ends. Okay. Um, and if the husband is not willing to change their ways and they expect that the wife is just a cook a cleaner, someone who just picks up the kids, then that wife is with the wrong person. Right. Um, in the same way that you married this girl because you were going to look after her and you were going to protect her. Otherwise, she was in a very good home. And she could have been with someone who would have loved her and doted over her and so on. If you're seeing that he's adamant that, you know what, um, this is my right and you're going to have to accept it. Then it's up to you now. Yeah. Either you turn around and you walk away, or you figure out where the both of you are heading. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's the husband's philosophy, you cannot later on say, well, I never knew. At the end of the day, you've got the ability now to communicate. Yeah, it's you, either going to head one way or the other. You're responsible <coughs> for your own choices, as it were. Yeah, and I think that there are some who are in marriages because they fear what could happen if they leave the marriage. Mm. But you can't be saying, well, I don't want you to do this, but I want to stick with you in marriage. Look, if the person is like that, you need to make a decision quickly because yeah. you're going to end up harming yourself. And in turn, ruining a relationship or causing the end of a relationship which you really weren't the cause of, but because of the effects of the behaviors, you turn out to be the bad, bad one. one. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, be rational on this issue and make it clear to the guy that, listen, you want to stay with me, then it's not a lifestyle for you to be sleeping with everybody while you're married to me. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani. Thank you. Um, viewers, we've run out of time, so inshallah, we'll join us again next week from <coughs> Dr. Sayyid Aman Akshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali. See you again, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Yeah.